Welcome to part two of this week's podcast. So what what I'm talking about here is verse 33, where Jesus says, If ye enter not into my law, ye cannot receive the promise of my father, which he made unto Abraham. And I think what he's talking about there is marriage. If you're not married, then you cannot receive the promise of my father, which he made under Abraham. And, And you can see how that would be, because how can you have seed if you're not married, you know, and, or if you have seed, but you're not married, then then you're not worthy of the Abrahamic covenant. But, but that's tough. And this is another place where we have to be relying on God and the atonement to make everything right. Because some people don't have the opportunity to marry. For some people, it's not going to happen for a, for a wide variety of reasons. For a lot of people, this would not happen. And it makes me, frankly, it makes me not even want to talk about marriage because I can, I can think about how painful it can be for a lot of people listening. But if we don't talk about marriage, then we, we lose sight of it as a guiding ideal that's really important. And even in the secular world, you find information about how important it is. There are there are studies that uh, children do a lot better when their parents are married. It's it's better for the rising generation. There's I was reading a an NIH funded um, study this morning about how people who married are live longer. You know it's 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 good for us. That there there's also <laughs> there's also a lot of evidence that when there's a divorce, men become less happy and women become more happy. And to, to that's to, to to me that's a call. <laughs> That's a call that we need to do better in our marriages and making them serve women as well as they serve men. Um, but there's, in addition to all of the spiritual growth that comes with marriage, there are concrete practical reasons that even sociologists, you know, running studies see that marriage is an important thing on a society, society level for us to pursue. Yeah. Well, and I think what you did there, Kate, is, is yes, we're going to talk about the ideal, but let's see people. Let's hear people. Let's, let's make sure we acknowledge the pain that comes from living in a fallen world where the ideal often, uh, you, you fall short of the ideal that something happens. And uh, I've thought of some of the incredible scholars we've had on who are single, John, and just are incredible, incredible minds, people in every way, servants of the Lord. And yet this blessing isn't available to them for some reason or another. Um, I think Kate did an excellent job there of like, let's see this. Let's make sure we acknowledge this pain. And I think the Lord does that too, right? Um, he's like, but he doesn't shrink from the ideal because of it. President Ballard recently gave that talk and acknowledged the this huge group of our church, a large part of our church, the single adult, you know, and which is another, this can be a painful topic for them too. Over half of the members of Relief Society are unmarried. Yeah. So, so it, that, that might be people who were married and, and are now widowed, you know, it, it, but, but at this moment, over half of the members of Relief Society are, are unmarried. Yeah. So. And Kate, wouldn't you say the Lord is interested not just in this life, but the next? <laughs> and yes. That's really a big part <laughs> of this section is, yes, in this life, it's, it can be very difficult. And uh, your choices, other people's choices, the fall, all of this can be very difficult. But he's, he's talking about an ideal in the next life, which is going to be available to everyone. Yes. Anyone who yes. wants it. I think we can hold that. We can hold our grief for people who who don't have this blessing in this life or who are married, sealed by the covenant and are miserable or in a, an abusive situation. Like we, ha- we, we hold their pain too. And at the same time, we recognize that the commandments are to help our flourishing. And we have these commandments because for a majority of people, m- marriage is a way to promote flourishing for the people involved and for the children. And if we have that ideal, that also can help us work to make our own marriages places where both partners are, are flourishing. That was very well said. It seems like the, the next few verses can be p- potentially painful as well. Yes. It doesn't get better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I think here's here. Yeah. With 33 was 
marriage and now we're getting into okay answering joseph's question right Yes. So it, I think of 33 is the last right. <laughs> is the last verse on <laughs> marriage between one man and one woman, one woman. And uh, now we're getting into plural marriage. So here's the buckle up part. Yeah. And yes, I, I built a foundation. Now I'm going to answer the question you asked at the beginning after I built the foundation of what traditional one man, one woman marriage is. Um, Jacob 2, it's like 27 through 30. And the my when I look at verse thirty in there, that's like one of the only scriptural hints that we have of one of the possible reasons of plural marriage is that if I will raise up seed unto me, I will command my people semicolon, otherwise they will hearken to these things, the verses above, one man, one woman in marriage. So I'm glad you brought those those verses up. The very reason Jacob brought them together. Mm-hmm. was because they were using the scriptures to excuse themselves in in marrying more than one person, having more than one relationship and Jacob is is ready to bring down the the hellfire on him for you can't mm-hmm. do this this is you, not okay using David and Solomon whose names are going to come up here as a matter of fact I'm glad John brought up those specific verses and, and and read them and that information about to raise up a righteous seed we have allowed that in our imaginations to give us um, inaccurate understandings. I don't know about you when you were on your missions. When I was on my mission, I taught what my trainer had taught me, and it's incorrect. And it was to say that the reason we had plural marriage in Utah is because there were more women than men. And so in order for all of those women to be able to be married, you know, there had to be plural marriage. And that's not true. That's incorrect. There were more men than there were women. But the thing that is correct is there were more righteous men than there were women. There were more men who took the the restored gospel very seriously and church participation and obedience and all of that very seriously. So for a woman who was wanted that kind of a relationship, her her choices were more narrow. Okay. I'm not saying that that explains plural marriage. Right. But but we also see that the descendants of those plural marriages, hardly any, if any, I'm trying to remember, um, descendants of plural marriages that took place in Nauvoo. But there are definitely a lot of descendants that resulted from plural marriages in Utah. I'm, I'm one of them. And um, among them have been church leaders for decades, for, gener- for generations. So it it did... It did produce a righteous seed. Okay. Yeah, that's really good. Um, he starts out by coming back to Abraham. Yes. Right. I'm glad you noticed. Yes. Uh, and it th- these verses, I think, teach us important things about the practice of plural marriage, which God wanted at this particular time. And one is Sarah gave Hagar to Abraham to wife. Yeah. That, so God it, commanded yeah. Abraham and Sarah gave Hagar to Abraham to wife. I wish I could ask our listeners what they, what they make of that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what I think is Sarah had agency here, mm-hmm. right? There was consent she, she, from She might Sarah. not have had a, a ton of agency, but she, <laughs> but she <laughs> gave her consent. And I think Jesus is setting this up as a model here that a first wife gives consent to other marriages. And, and the way this played out, the way this played out with in Nauvoo was more complicated. This didn't always happen. Nauvoo plural marriage is very different than Utah marriage, plural marriage. In Nauvoo, they were trying to figure it out. They knew there would be a lot of social opposition. They knew it could wound a lot of their loved ones. And they were keeping it secret as they tried to figure it out. But the secrecy was really wounding too. So this, this part of it was not always, was sometimes, but not always fulfilled in Nauvoo or, and including in Joseph and Emma's own marriage. Really okay. good point. In Utah, it was more often, there, there's still, you know, fallen people. There were still people who didn't um, obtain the consent of their mm. first wives to take on more wives, but the rule, they were supposed to. Well, it's important here that God was involved. 
Sarah was involved. Yes. Uh, and that's why he says they were not under condemnation for I, the Lord, commanded it. Yeah. Great. Great point. That's essential. That's essential for this to be to be okay. And then it's really strange because suddenly we go back to Abraham in verse 36, but we're not talking about plural marriage again. Abraham was commanded to offer his son Isaac. Nevertheless, it was written, thou shalt not kill. Abraham, however, did not refuse, and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. I like, I like that the Lord is bringing up this, this Abrahamic test, as we've come to call it, because I feel like plural marriage is kind of an Abrahamic test for the whole church, and even for us today. Even f for us today, trying to make sense of this is kind of an Abrahamic test. For some of us. Yes, absolutely. And a, and a lot of the people who were alive during the time when this practice was part of the church, they referred to it this way as, as an Abrahamic, Abrahamic test. Abrahamic test. Mm -hmm. And why an Abrahamic test? Because it was as painful as having to offer up your son as a sacrifice. It was, I mean, this was, this was painful. All of the ideals that they had of rom of romantic marriage of the intimacy of marriage between two people instead of marriage among five people or, or more, they had to give up all of those ideals, which were really, really valued and prevalent in society at that time. You know, we, even more so than now, now we have a lot of other right. visions of, of marriage than they, they did back then. Uh, so this, this was tough. This was a big ask. Kate, I don't know if you're going to bring this up later. I don't want to steal it from you. But if I remember right, when Joseph introduces this principle, the Brigham, Brigham says, it's the first time I desired the grave. I, oh, yeah, I, he saw a funeral envied, and, and he envied the corpse that he saw in the funeral. Yeah, he said, I'd rather <laughs> yeah. die than, than, yeah. than live this. Yes. Right. I, I hope I didn't it, steal that from you, but I, no, I imagine no. everybody felt that way. I th I think that the what I read is n nobody liked it. They all, I mean Hiram, Joseph's own brother, just resisted and resisted for for years. And you know, Oliver for a Cowdery, of years there, pretty upset mm -hmm. with Joseph and. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then imagine, you know, the the women who heard about this because mo usually because they were invited to be sealed to Joseph Smith, they hated it too. But. That we're on the foundation of God's love and grace here in this section. And God did. He answered prayers. And not, not every woman said yes. And those women who said yes, they had spiritual experiences, they, deep ones, profound ones, letting them know uh, that this was God's will. So they didn't have to go into this blind. Most women would have to have something pretty powerful, you know. And so agency consent still operative here is what you're saying. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And for, you know, we, we always think about how tough it was on women and it was, and it was also so tough on men. This is not a <laughs> easy thing financially or emotionally. Yeah. Um, I want to make a note about verse 36, where he mentions this commandment to sacrifice Isaac, right? Nothing, uh, just imagine that we all have children. Uh, everyone listening probably has nieces and nephews or children or, or uh, just the idea that you're going to sacrifice this child uh, is horrific. And I think it was meant to be. It was meant to be a severe, severe test. <laughs> well, oh, I can't imagine. Um, where Joseph Smith says this, I, uh, he says, that which is wrong under one circumstance may be. And often is right under another. God said, thou shalt not kill. At another time, he has said, thou shalt utterly destroy. This is the principle on which the government of heaven is conducted. Revelation adapted to circumstance. Revelation adapted to circumstance. Whatever God requires is right, no matter what it is. Although we may not see the reason till long after the events transpire. I bring this up with Nephi killing Laban in the Book of Mormon. Uh, that we've grown up with it, and so we're pretty used to it. But someone who is a first-time reader of the Book of Mormon might be horrified by the idea of Nephi killing Laban, right? Um, uh, and so I, I don't think anyone needs to come into plural marriage feeling good about it, like, oh, this is this is a good thing. This is I feel so warm and fuzzy inside, right? Uh, I don't think that's the Lord's expectation. He's just saying this is revelation adapted to circumstance. 
this is my law. This is how we're going to do this. Uh, so I, I don't know. I, I like the comparison with Nephi killing Laban, that it's, it's an exception, not the rule. But I, you have to trust Nephi and trust the Lord that this is really from him. I think that's another really powerful explanation for why we have this verse 36 that otherwise doesn't seem to, to fit. And it's because that is the, the rule is do not sleep with any, anyone other than your, your, spouse. your wife, the person you're married to. Um, but then here's a situation just like Abraham's situation, just like Nephi's situation where you do something different. I, I think that's exactly why it's in there. Wow. This is, this is a uh, intense scripture. Um, let's keep going, Kate. Keep walking us through this. So then we get several scriptures again, looking to, to ancient prophets who had more than one wife. And it, it explains that most of them, um, it was accounted unto them for righteousness. They, they were not sinning when they did this because they were, they were doing it according to God's will. But then one of them did not do it a according to God's will. This is verse 39 with, with David. Uh, so at first it was okay. It says, in none of these things did he sin against me, save, except in the case of Uriah and his wife. And we know that's um, Bathsheba. David sees her bathing, desires her, sleeps with her, and then uh, d does doesn't want to get caught, so sends him to the front lines where in, in battle be he's, killed. Oh. he's sure to be killed. I yeah. remember the jaw drop that I had in seminary when I learned that the same David, hero David who slew Goliath, was this same David. I thought, wait, but, 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 but no, but yeah. he slew Goliath. Such but, a disappointment. <laughs> so eight yeah. foot, eight foot giants are no problem, but your own lust. Oh man, I just, that was a, that was a sad day. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so, and so we see what happens to him. Um, David hath fallen from his exaltation. He received his portion already. He shall not inherit more out of the world. Um, God gave that portion, that heavenly, you know, those thrones and principalities and powers. Those are given to, unto a, another person. Now, Kate, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I see in verse 39, the Lord saying, this principle I'm going to give you, plural marriage, has very strict boundaries. And yes. you cannot cross those boundaries. This isn't a, okay, do whatever you want type thing if you want this. This is a, this is a strict law that we're going to carefully hold in, in, in line. Is that, would I be correct in saying that in verse 39? This is very serious. I think that's absolutely true. So I think, I think we've learned two things bef so far. And the first is that the first wife should consent. And the second is this, that this is not a free for all. And the, yeah. and, and the way this played out, the way my house is a house of order comes out in, in what we're talking about now is you have, you had to ask the prophet, right? You couldn't practice plural marriage with authority unless you had Joseph Smith's permission. And then in, in Utah, Brig Brigham Young's permission. Isn't that Joseph's conflict with John C. Bennett is John C. Bennett is seeing his, Hey, I can do whatever I want here. And Joseph is no, this is strict. Yes. And, and John C. Bennett had not been brought into, into this story of Joseph. Like he just heard, rumors but he hadn't been invited he hadn't invited joseph smith had not invited him to practice plural marriage but he took those rumors and used them and and so did um a few other of of his friends used them to seduce women saying i have and because they were friends with joseph smith women believed them you know i have authority joseph smith has told me that i have authority to sleep with with people, women that I'm not married to and, and did. And then the, those women had to come up on public trial. And we, we have, we don't know a lot of detail about plural marriage in Nauvoo because it was secret and people didn't even write, most people, there are a couple of exceptions, didn't even write about it in their journals. Um, but we do have these court cases of people who were seduced and deceived, seduced and deceived and, so because this is this could be so abused, the Lord is putting very strict rules on it, and he uses David as an example. Mm -hmm. and, and another evidence of why we learned early in this section, my house is a house of order. 
you can see how high the stakes are um, with that by the time you get here. And I'm I'm glad about that. I don't know. There's something about that that says yes, I'm going to command this, but I this is a very strict, careful uh, principle that we're going to live. I, I that gives me confidence I, moving forward with this. I, I'd like to make sure, and I want to restate something Kate said. So you had to be invited by the president of the church, by the prophet, to particip- to participate in this, whether that was Joseph Ford in Salt Lake Brigham. But, and those who, and but there were some who, who lied and Abused. said that they had been, yeah, and yeah. so we. I, I have heard percentages thrown around. I don't know. Maybe this isn't the time to talk about it, but about how many were actually practicing this in in Salt Lake era, for example. How many of the men of the church or uh, were practicing this in Salt Lake or Nauvoo? Do we know? Do we have good numbers? Uh, we don't have good numbers. It not not for lack of of trying, um, but but the the people who have looked very closely at this still feel that there are too many um, sort of questions and not enough data to really come out with a a secure number. We know it was not a majority of people; it was a minority of of people, um, especially a minority of men. Um. That's uh, what I think Elizabeth Keene called historical silence, right? She said, you got to get used to historical silence. (laughs) She has a lot Um, of good phrases, good smart phrases. (laughs) So we we know there are clearly um, very specific ways to go go about doing this. And then uh, finally, we know that agency is essential. And, And we see this in the way that Joseph Smith went about this. Uh, he didn't tell women they were going to be sealed to him or to someone else. He he asked them and he invited them to go on their own and think about it and, and pray about it. That was a very important part of this process. Um, and and let's, let's talk about when this revelation, we talked about how this revelation came in July of 1843, but that is not the beginning of plural marriage. And, and we, again, there are a lot of question marks, but it it looks like Joseph Smith was probably in about 1833, uh, sealed to what was probably his first, uh, plural wife. And we don't know with some unions, because women spoke later in Utah, signed affidavits on this. We know that there were, there was a sexual relationship that was part of some of these marriages. And that, and we also know that a lot of these marriages didn't have a sexual component. And we also don't have evidence of any of Joseph Smith having children with any of his plural wives. So what, what that ends up looking like is not all of these were marriages in the sexual sense. And even if they were marriages in the sexual sense, it wouldn't have been a lot or there would have been children resulting from the unions. So in 1843, he has this revelation because even though, even though God told him to practice this, you know, 10 years earlier, and he, more than 10 years, he, he resisted and resisted and resisted. And, and as he describes it, an angel came to him three different times saying, you have to do this and finally threatened him with, with death and destruction and like, problems in the ever it's a threat to his exaltation if he didn't do this he he finally he finally began to practice plural marriage but it was sort of a little bit at a time and this period in Nauvoo is when he's practicing it a lot more he ha- he has a number of wives by the time this revelation comes and that has led some people to speculate that he uh, asked for this revelation in order to appease Emma, because there were times when she was aware of what was going on and she felt okay about it, felt like it was God's will. And there were other times when it was so painful for her that she couldn't stand it and she was against it. So when Joseph Smith received this revelation, he already had some plural wives. He was in the red brick store, which is such an important building upstairs. And, you know, it was a store. So that's important for the community. That's where they could go to buy supplies and food. And upstairs is where they were 
studying together where um, I think at this point it was still only men were preparing for the temple endowment, although that became uh, women. Um, th th those early meetings were were up here on the second floor. The Relief Society was formally organized and had a lot of their early meetings here on this second floor of the red brick store. So this building is a big deal. And Joseph Smith was in his office there. And William Clayton is the one who was scribe, who Joseph spoke the revelation and William Clayton uh, wrote it down. And William Clayton said, well, he, he's the one who said, well, Hiram came to Joseph and said, Emma is still resisting this. And uh, so try to have a revelation. Maybe that will help her. Um, but that that's William Clayton is the source on, on, on that. So a lot of people have taken that to be the actual story. And it, it very well could be but I'm not 100% convinced that, that that is the story. Yeah. Um, and Kate, will you co correct this if I'm wrong? Because I, I love being corrected, actually. Uh, but a lot of what we know about Nauvoo doesn't come till decades later when people are talking about it finally in the 18, I don't know, 60s, 70s. Uh, and I, I, as a historian, I, aren't I supposed to – I'm not a historian, but as a historian – as I'm trying to be a historian, aren't I supposed to be a little bit more careful with memories that are 20, 30 years after the fact uh, than I am with maybe a contemporary source? Can you talk about that just a little bit, that what we know about polygamy maybe comes from these later sources that, oh, as much as people, I don't think they're lying. I just think that memories can change over over time. Uh, yes, that's absolutely tr true, Hank. Um, I our our best friends as his, our best tools as historians are things that are written at the really close to the time something happened so that's journal entries and letters and even newspaper articles and newspaper ar articles are good because they're contemporary they happened around the or they were written around the same time as the event happened but they're also second hand so they're not perfect but they're but they're good really our job as a historian is to always weigh evidence. We try to triangulate. Maybe we can get a newspaper article and a letter and then a memoir, somebody looking back and telling the story 50 years later. And then we start to feel more confident about what really happened. And, th and this is why our hands are tied. You know, if we only have one source that says something, it could be, I mean, William Clayton, was the scribe for this revelation. He, he he was there, but we don't have Joseph Smith and Hiram Smith saying it. So yeah, writing yeah, it down we, right then. We're, yeah, yeah, we're all we're always weighing those things. Yeah. Carefully. It, this is yeah. one of the things that just fascinates me about church history and helps me extend mercy is because the only sources we have are the only sources we have. And some are better than th those people aren't here to defend themselves. They're not here to be interviewed. And uh, my dad once was a, a hero in a bad accident. And the newspaper article that came out about it was complimentary, but there were so many errors about the facts that I just think I, you know, sometimes it's, it's hard to know. And, and therefore we're backed up against the wall of faith and, and asking the, the Lord to help us feel peace about things sometimes. Cause we've got what we've got, but, uh, thankfully we have, we have revelation and the Holy ghost to comfort it as well when we don't get it. And because the, the, the newspaper writers have agendas too. my first, oh, my first experience being quoted, I did an interview. I was in graduate school. I was young still, and I thought I told a joke. And in the newspaper article, it came out that my joke oh, no. ended up as the final lines of the article. Oh. And then ten years later, the reporter used it again. Oh, <laughs> <word>. So I, <laughs> we, yeah, we we just we try to weigh things and and keep all of this in mind. We we try to be. Um, we, we recognize bias, we recognize holes, and we, we try to have the, the best integrity we can have as scholars a and, and grace. I really believe oh, yes. for every historian inside or outside of the church, you, you, you want to be honest and you also want to give people the benefit of the doubt. R Richard Bushman said 
so beautifully to one of his students who who repeated it to me. Uh, just know that this person that you're writing about, how, how will you feel about what you've written when you see them and shake hands with them in the afterlife? It's just it's something we as Latter Day Saints keep in mind. And it doesn't. I mean, I believe those people would want us to be honest. It doesn't mean we whitewash anything, but it does mean that we we approach this with empathy and respect mm. for their humanity. Beautiful. Mm. Oh, that mm. is so well said. Mm-hmm. I, I, I tell my students, I get my medical advice from trained doctors. I get my dental advice from trained dentists and I get my history <laughs> from trained historians. Uh, I, you know, it, not everyone is a historian, despite what the internet tells you. Not everyone is a historian <laughs> just because they have a source doesn't mean that they've, they've done the work. Um, This might be a good chance for us to talk about a new book that I think would be helpful for anyone who's struggling, uh, written by Brittany Nash. I think it's called, John, uh, you can help me out here. It's the, they've done a series. I think Brad Wilcox, uh, who we interviewed before, did one on Patriarchal Blessings. They have kind of similar covers. And this one, is it just called Plural Marriage or? I think it's called Let's Talk Let's About, talk about it. Plural Marriage by Brittany Nash. I was listening mm-hmm. to her interview on a podcast called All In. Mm-hmm. Uh, if anybody knows that podcast, which I really like. So if anybody knows Morgan Jones, who's the interview on that podcast, tell her a good job for from us here at Follow Him. But um, I think that I, I just thought the things she said were excellent. I just want to read something from her really quick. It's uh, Morgan quoted this on her interview with with uh, Brittany. She says, when I first began my journey studying polygamy, I was angry by what I saw as an injustice that God required such a difficult principle to be lived by these faithful, tried people. But as I studied the personal writing, stories, and testimonies of polygamists, accepting them on their own terms, that's a lot what Kate just mentioned, she says, I found peace. The practice could have never been sustained for a half century by compulsion, manipulation, or simple sexual desire. Those who set the foundation of the Latter-day Saint faith were not two-dimensional superheroes, as they are sometimes portrayed, but they were complex, strong, intelligent, full-bodied kingdom builders who are willing to leave loved ones, wealth, comfort, and native countries for what they believe to be true. This same willingness drove them to accept polygamy a practice they accepted as a commandment of God instituted in their time for his unique purposes. And I'll finish here. I have since come to view plural marriage as part of the Latter-day Saint history to unapologetically own and to hold as one of the most valuable testaments of the faith in the history of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I love that. <laughs> Boy, she should so be a writer. I'm so glad you shared that, Hank. <laughs> she is a writer and she's a she's a great researcher and she worked on this for a long long time you can trust the work she did on that yeah. book well you sold me that is a beautiful way to put it and and to go to original sources what did the people involved actually say uh, i'm so appreciative of that kind of a thing instead of all of us judging this you know, decades later, looking back and making our own judgments. So that's a great one, Hank. That's Brittany Nash. And you can listen to her podcast with Morgan Jones on All In, or you can pick up the book, Let's Talk About Polygamy, or Let's Talk About Plural Marriage. I think it's one or the other. Um, And I will say this too, John, you bring up a great statement in my mind from McLean Heward. Do you remember Dr. Heward when he came on way back section 40 or something, back when we were brand new at this? And he said, please stop being offended on their behalf and start being inspired by them. I've always remembered that. Stop being offended on their behalf and and be inspired by these people. Read their stories. Read what they actually have to say. All right. uh, John and I have taken over too long, Kate. Let's go back to you and let you take over. No, Hank, but that important quotation you just read also reminds me of our our brothers and sisters of color say that same thing to – to white people who who want to do the right thing, but then end up making up things that are a little off the mark or defending them in ways that don't feel tr- true to them. The mm. the brothers and sisters of color, it, it's this, it's the same thing. Listen to them, listen to their voices, listen to their stories, their testimonies. Absolutely, I really like that. Yeah. Okay, uh, we've got we're about halfway through our section. Let's keep going. 
if we look in verse 40, again, we have that mention of, um, I give unto thee, my servant Joseph, an appointment and restore all things. So again, we're being reminded that this is a restoration. It's just an important thing to remember. Then we have all of these verses about adultery and when what somebody thinks might be plural marriage isn't plural marriage. It's actually adultery. And and some for, for those listeners, for those people out there who will read this carefully, you'll see a little bit of contradiction. You'll see that what it says here isn't how it always played out in Joseph Smith's practice of plural marriage. And so then again, I think we need to go back down here to uh, verse 66 at the end. And now as pertaining to this law, verily, verily, I say unto you, I will reveal more unto you hereafter. So that that's not only a sentence for us, it was a sentence for Joseph Smith himself. And it was a sentence for the, the saints as life in Nauvoo wrapped up and they traveled west and they kept um, staying with this principle in Utah and plural marriage looked different then uh, than it did in Nauvoo. And then in 1890, when w Wilford Woodruff announced that there should be an end to plural marriage, um, that that was very devastating for a lot of saints who had d sacrificed so much for this principle. And, th and they felt not only the sacrifice, but they just felt it was a, a key thing that set them apart and was a crucial part of their testimony to hear the prophet, whom they would honor because they were, these were Orthodox believers, uh, say that this will no longer be a part of our system. That was a whole new new trial. So mm -hmm. continuing revelation or the, wow. the way it says in here, I will reveal, reveal more unto you. That's another really important thing to keep in mind in studying both this section and the practice of plural marriage. Um, what a turnaround. I, That's such a fascinating turnaround, is it? Yeah. So hard to accept and then so, so hard, hard to let to go leave. of. I see. I'd never, I'd never thought of that. I thought they'd be phew, glad that's over, but it's more like, but wait, these are our families. These are our relationships. This is, we have a testimony of it, you know, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And, th and you get at something really important, J John, that one of the reasons it was hard was because it threatened family bonds and it made, it made some wives much more vulnerable, you know, financially, physically. It, it was, t it was another Abrahamic test yeah. trial. Yeah. Test. Um, and, and, and there were people who were very relieved. I just, <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> I want to make sure we're covering all of the perspectives. Um, Kate, I think, uh, and I want to ask this correctly. I, I think on our listeners' mind might be the fear that Joseph or Brigham is using this to get that they want. Is there anything in there in the historical record that says Joseph and Brigham or any others were were this didn't think this was from God? They knew it wasn't from God, and they were just kind of s sneaking in something because they knew the people would buy it. I just I want to calm that fear coming from anyone. Is there anything in the history that says they? They were trying to pull the she the wool over someone's eyes. Good, no, <laughs> no. There, I mean, nothing, nothing in any letter. Uh, nothing. It it it's very clear to me that this was something that they believed uh, God want not didn't just want but com commanded them to do. And and also, I, Kathleen Flake is the one who first mentioned this perspective, so I'm roughly quoting her, but. There are a lot easier ways to have extramarital sex or to have sex with a lot of women than to marry them, you know, and be, and be responsible <laughs> not for too, the offspring and everything. Too coarse, but yeah. yeah, and to and to invent this elaborate. There are plenty of other religious leaders, not Latter Day Saints, who also uh, had vibrant sexual lives. They did not. They they just did it. There was you know, no theology. There was no theology. There was no revelation. There was no um, explanation and bringing bringing people in carefully and telling them and telling them to go and pray about it. There there was none of that. This is this is an exceptional situation. This does not look like uh, those other cases. Mm. I think that's important to I, I, thank you, Kate. I think that was very important to to for people that just kind of calm their fears a little bit that. Joseph isn't the man they thought he was, right? 
I hope there were there are a couple more fears I hope we could just talk about briefly. And and one is the situation of Joseph's youngest wife. And the other, so you'll remind me of it, um, is plural marriage in the afterlife. Because I know that's okay. that's maybe that's a what yeah. people worry about the most right now. Well, here comes agency um, again, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> so did um, did you want to talk about Helen Mark Kimball for a second? Yes. Would, yeah. So uh, Helen Mark Kimball was 14 when she married Joseph Smith. And some of us want to think... Oh, uh, people regularly got married at age 14 back then. Well, that was young back then. It wasn't unheard of and it was legal, but it was young. Uh, Joseph Smith didn't approach Helen Mark Kimball. Helen Mark Kimball's father approached Joseph Smith because he wanted through his daughter for his family to be sealed to Joseph Smith. And there, are, there's an article on this by uh, Spencer Fluman. It's available online. Yeah, and it's terrific. So I highly recommend that for anybody who who wants to look closely into this. Um, and the theology. My, my husband Sam Brown um, has written a lot about this in in different venues, including a book called "In Heaven as It Is on Earth." But it it ex- helps explain why. The plural marriage, it sometimes involved sex. And with Helen Mark Kimball, we have her reminiscences about plural marriage. We have a, actually a lot of records about her, which is great because she was so young that she's the one that tr- troubles us the most. She never mentioned there was a sexual component to this marriage. But we do know she suffered on account of it because she lost her hopes for romance and, you know, all those things a a teenager has of who am I going to marry and what will my wedding be like and all of that, that, that was all gone for her. And she stayed, she lived for decades. She lived to be an old woman and she stayed faithful to the church the whole time, which I think helps, which I think is an important context for that, for that union. When we hear these people. Yeah. See them. Yes. Yes. See her whole story. She didn't run screaming. Um, And I think I didn't finish this thought, uh, but plural marriage was a lot. We didn't, we didn't practice sealings then the way that we do now where you're, you're sealed. Like my husband and I are sealed and we were married in the temple. And so our children were part of the covenant with us or another couple can join the church or get married in the temple after they're married. And then their children are sealed to them. That wasn't, that came much, much later right now. In the church, sealings meant just being um, part of a family network with people that would help secure your salvation. And so that this is why even there are women who were married, who are sealed, who were sealed to Joseph Smith while their husbands were alive, and that's the way to make sense of that. Is maybe their husband wasn't a member of the church. You know, and getting sealed to a really valiant person, especially the prophet. There are all kinds of people sealing themselves to the prophet, even after his death. Sealing themselves as a child, sealing themselves, you know. Right. All, all they these just other want to be things. connected to him in an ordinance. They, they want to be connected to him and they want to be saved. And they saw being sealed to him as a way to secure their own salvation. So that is what Helen's father was trying to achieve for for their family. Helen then did have a choice about whether to enter this marriage, and it was something that she prayed about. But unlike some other women who entered plural marriages, she said she did not. Ha- she had no angel appear. She did not have a a large, brilliant revelation. She said she ch- she decided to enter this marriage because of logic, because it made sense of sense to her. Uh, for the the things we were talking about, the, the, her own salvation and the salvation of her family, and her her records say that it was it was difficult, but she felt that she made the right choice in it also. And we, I know, when I was fourteen, you know, I would have been influenced. I don't want to whitewash this. I would have been influenced what what my bishop, let alone my prophet, wanted me to do, and what my parents wanted me to do. Uh, but it it's important to me still to honor. The decision that she made. I mean, Joseph Smith was also 14 when he had the first vision. You know, it's important to me to honor the agency that she did have, the decision she made, and particularly her legacy of staying 
not just true to the church, but really continuing to build Zion throughout her life. And, and, and one last thought on plural marriage in, in Utah is that not everyone said yes to it. And those who did not say yes to it were not, you know, excommunicated. They were not excluded. Sarah Kimball, who was one of the founders of Relief Society, after the death of her husband, she never married again. She, d she didn't become a plural wife. And she was one of our most important leaders in Relief Society for decades. She was a Relief Society president for decades. She helped Eliza R. Snow reestablish Relief Society throughout Utah because it was disrupted um, towards the end of the Nauvoo period. Um, she, you know, all praise to her. All of the people in the high circles were friends with her and honored her. So it, it, there was, you could still be socially successful in Salt Lake and in the church, um, even while turning down plural marriage. I think that's an important thing to understand. So, so, so really this was, this was for these people, we've said it, but I want to say it again, an Abrahamic test. It was very difficult for some of them. It worked out better than for others. Some of them got, some women got along really well with their sister wives and they found they had some freedom to develop their talents and, you know, they would take, take turns, um, caring for each other's children. And, and it really, it worked in a beautiful way. And other people didn't get along well with their sister wives, or there was a lot of jealousy over limited resources. So f for a lot of people, there was also pain. For Emmeline Wells, whose diaries are published, um, we're, we're continually publishing them. And a lot of them are, are online now on the Church Historians Press site. She's a fabulous diarist, um, it keeps very detailed diaries and and you can see in her diaries the the pain that came from plural marriage especially when she was married to Daniel H Wells um whom she really loved and she just wanted to have more time with him they were both intellectuals and she she enjoyed talking with him and and exchanging ideas but you also see her absolute faith that she was doing the right thing that he was doing the right thing and she's she's devoted her entire life to building the church and supporting the gospel so it's important for us to honor the legacy of uh, women and men who ex who accepted this. Kate, what you just said reminds me of uh, a quote from Brittany Nash, who I just mentioned earlier. It's actually not a quote from Brittany Nash, but a quote from a woman she studied uh, who was in a polygamous marriage and a plural marriage. And this is her name is Martha Cragen Cox. And this is what she wrote. She said, to me, it is a joy to know that we laid the foundation of a life to come while we lived in that plural marriage, that we three, and she's talking about the three women who loved each other more than sisters, children of one mother love will go hand in hand together down through all eternity. That knowledge, that knowledge is worth more to me than gold and more than compensates for all the sorrow I have ever known. And that, that, that's oh. <laughs> that's beautiful. It, and that gets at something that, it, you know, one of the things that plural ma marriage did was it opened people up. It, it broadened their sense of who they were responsible for. I think that's a challenge we have today in our nuclear families is to really take seriously our responsibilities to our ward families, to the, to the people beyond our nuclear family. Of course, we prioritize our nuclear family, but Plural marriage was an effective way to get people to really look out for each other beyond beyond themselves. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. <laughs> and, and, um, and I wonder, just as we finish up, there, there's one more fear I know people have, and so I wanted to address it. And, and maybe it's the biggest fear people have now, especially female church members, in thinking about the afterlife. And that is, will I be forced to practice plural marriage? What our current leaders have assured us is uh, that that nobody will be forced to practice plural marriage in the eternities. And what we know is that those foundational truths of God's love and mercy and that foundational truth of agency. Mm -hmm. So I... It just, it's not, it's not the gospel I believe in if people were, it's, it's not the gospel that exists in our scriptures 
um, and in our other holy texts, if if we were to be forced to participate in plural marriage. The Lord promises a fullness of joy, right? I have that uh, Elder Bruce Sharma Conkey said once, plural marriage is not essential to salvation or exaltation. Nephi and his people were denied the power to have more than one wife, and yet they could gain every blessing in eternity that the Lord ever offered to any people. In our day, the Lord summarized by revelation the whole doctrine of exaltation and predicated it upon the marriage of one man to one woman. And the reference is Doctrine and Covenants section 132, verses 1 through 28, when he said that. So so it's a good reminder that there's plenty of scriptural evidence um, in addition to the fact that plural marriage is not a prerequisite for salvation. I, I think the reason this is so painful to think about is because death is painful, the separation that comes with death. I, I remember my, my grandma, I, I grew up with my grandma, and my grandpa died when I was five. And every once in a while, she would admit he was really worried when she died and he came to meet her that he would have another wife on his arm. It was a very real oh, fear wow. for her. Hmm. And even my, my cousin recently left a husband and, and she just worries, she's young, she's in her 50s, that by the time she dies, they won't have much in common anymore because they will have had such different perspectives for d- decades. You know, it's, it, with our human minds, it's, a, it's poignant and it, it hurts. I remember I, I myself, when I was facing a life-threatening illness and was considering the possibility of my own death, theoretically, I'd always thought I wanted, if I were to die, I wanted my husband to take another wife for, for companionship, for all of these good things that we get through marriage. But when I thought about it in actual terms, it was excruciatingly yeah. painful. Yeah. Um, and I, I think one, one sort of analogy that's helped me is in, in the business world or in my world too, in the history department at church headquarters, you, you know that a manager is sometimes privy to information that the, the direct reports to the manager just don't have because that's what a manager does. It, the manager has other conversations. And then the higher up you go, you know, the more that person is privy to information that, that the other people, the people who do more producing and less managing just don't have. And so you learn that you don't make your base, your decisions based solely on your own experience and what you know, you need to check in with the people ahead of you because they have more information than you do. And so in my job, I know that my boss checks in with our apostle advisors. So I know that he has a perspective and information that, that I don't have. Well, that is just a tiny little example of what you think about when you think of our relationship with God. God knows so much more than my boss or the church historian or or even the apostle advisors, right? God, God has all of the wisdom, all of the knowledge, all of the understanding. And so once again, we're back there to that foundation of faith in God and God's goodness. And if I think of every experience I've had when I have felt close to God, I have felt encouraged, I have felt peaceful, I have felt clear in my head, and I, above all, have felt loved. And that's, that's my tiny little experiences with God on earth, to be in his presence, to, to think about what the afterlife is out, what the different kingdoms are like. I think they're just that experience of God's love magnified over and over again. I don't even know what exponent to use. Yeah. But I love that. Trust the manager. He has the information. He's going to take care of you. I like that. Okay. Dr. Holbrook, I think um, our listeners would love to hear, you know, from someone who has studied these, uh, the history of the church so in depth as you have for so long, you don't look it, but for so long, um, what are your personal feelings towards Joseph Smith, his contemporaries, and, and the Restoration? You know, I, I am so grateful that I've had the job I've had where I get to – my my office is in the archive, and I get to call up these these documents, things in people's handwriting, and think about how to include them 
in stories and papers and books that then the rest of the church can can have. And and when I'm in my office with these records, uh, I feel guided by the Spirit so strongly, and and sometimes it feels like I I feel I really feel the Spirit of the person who created the document. Those experiences I have, you know, sometimes it's just not being able to find something I need and then having a missionary just stop by and wonder if I if I could use this and then it turns out to be just what I need. All of those everyday miracles that have happened throughout my career at the church history department have really taught me. I have the knowledge. I know what's in the sources now. But I also have all of those, uh, like the spiritual testimonies of the people who made the records, both because they've written things down and because I've, I've felt them. I, I've felt them with me. There is nothing to be afraid of in church history, except maybe getting information from a bad source or getting only a little bit of information when you when you need more. You need more context and you, you need other sources. Uh, but, but when you see it through and... It, I can say this with the opportunities I've had to see things through, and I think I've seen all the troubling things through in my own research. It all increases my faith. It all um, increases my wisdom. There's nothing out there that that I'm that I'm scared of. I know that God is in this church. I know that our Savior is in this church. I know that even this tricky. Revelation that we studied today, I know that it, God is in it, that Joseph Smith was a prophet, and that when we honor them and seek to go closer to them, they'll come closer to us. It's, that's where the truth is. John, it was a great episode of Follow Him. Mm -hmm. Man. It's going to bless a, a lot of people. Thank you so much, Kate, for being with us today. You've, you've blessed my life. and. Um, have changed the way I've, I will read and have marked this section forevermore. Well, th thank you so much for the kind words and for the opportunity to join you and talk about this. Uh, it was time well spent. Uh, we hope that all of our listeners feel the same way. We can't thank you enough for listening. We wouldn't have a podcast if it weren't for you. <laughs> we want to tell you that we're grateful. We want to thank our executive producers, Steve and Shannon Sorensen, and our production crew, uh, Will Stoughton, David Perry, Jamie Nielsen, Lisa Spice, and Kyle Nelson. And we hope all of you will join us on our next episode of Follow Him. Mm -hmm.